In this lecture, we will be looking at Chapter 28, Impressionism, Post-Impressionism, Symbolism, Europe and America, 1870 to 1900. Note, this is a shorter time period that we have been, than we've been discussing in previous chapters. Um, some things going on at the time, though. Between 1800 and 1900, the population in most of Europe's major cities exploded. An example was Paris. Um, the residents of Paris expanded from 500,000 to 2.7 million. And also during this time, we have what some art historians call the Second Industrial Revolution. And this focused more on steel, electricity, chemicals, and oils, and especially is using these as sources of fuel. We're also going to see at this time continue uh, rapid urbanization, the growth of cities, and we're going to see more of a decreasing in the number of farmers. And this is largely due, what we're going to see develop at this time, is large agricultural enterprises would come and run farming as a business, and they would often squeeze out the smaller property owners. Marxism developed at this time. This comes from Karl Marx, 1818 to 1883, and Frederick Engels, 1820 to 1895. Um, they were both Germans. Um, Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto in 1848, and this actually calls for the working classes to unite and overthrow the capital system. Because Marx saw this urbanization, industrialization, um, the means of production were mainly owned by the few, yet it was the workers that had to create the products, and they were often, he believed, exploited. And so he advocated for a socialist society, meaning the means of production are owned by the many and not the few. Also during this time period, this is the time of Charles Darwin, 1809 to 1882, and he was an English naturalist, and this is where he wrote his most famous work, which was On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection in 1859. And here what he claimed is that evolution is the natural result of a competitive system in which only the fittest survive. Now, this was challenged because this does contradict the biblical narrative of creation, and as such, it was often greeted with hostility by the public. Now, the text is also going to talk about modernism. Modernism is where how and what art is is challenged. We'll talk about this a little, but we'll actually talk about modernism more so in the next chapter. All right, well, this artist we talked about last chapter, this is Edouard Manet's A Bar at the Foie la Bourget, 1882, and it's an oil on canvas. And we already discussed a little last week how Manet was a more of a transitional artist. Usually he was put in with the realists, but for the reasons we discussed last week, he wasn't truly a realist. And so we're going to see here this transition from realism to impressionism. Here we see a barmaid. Um, this was a popular cafe with musical hall performers. And here we see the barmaid looking out at us, but she seems very disinterested. The front almost looks like a still life with the bottles, flowers, and fruit, all items that were for sale. In the reflection in the upper left, you see um, a patron or the patrons. You see a pair of legs from a trapeze artist. There's a woman in the balcony viewing something off to the side. Yet, what we see is transitioning into the Impressionism is the blurred brush strokes and this very um, rough application of paint. We also see visual discrepancies. If we are looking at her and the mirror would show her reflection, you can see her reflection actually seems off to the right. And if we were standing, you know, our vantage point, her reflection should be directly behind her. Um, and even if we say, well, off to the right is the reflection of a different woman, well, we should be able to visually see her. And so because of this, um, this is considered not truly realist, but it's not quite Impressionist yet. Impressionism, what the Impressionist artists were trying to do was it was a, they considered a new way of expressing reality. Impressionism was largely centered in France. And what they did is the painter sought to capture the psychological perception of reality in both color and motion. They saw themselves in competition with the camera, but they weren't trying to show things as they actually were. What they were trying to show was portraying the essentials of perception that the camera could not do. Often the subject matter in Impressionism is the everyday, middle, and working classes. 
Also, the painters, usually when you are prepping a canvas, you would paint it a dark color and paint on it. Well, what the Impressionists would do is they would actually paint the canvases white and then build up to the dark colors. And this, again, is opposite of most other styles. And this Impressionism was a profoundly different vision of the world. And it was a new way of rendering this vision on the canvas. And trust me, the paintings are usually much, are very small, only a couple of feet. And this definitely is different from the very large works we've been looking at. Usually the paintings um, would take place outdoor, and this would include painting in the, the artists themselves painting in the open air, or as the text says, on plain air, which means in the open air. These Impressionist artists would literally take their canvases and their easels out and paint. And we've seen artists before, you know, who've gone into nature, but usually these are just studies that are done, and then the artist goes into the studio and creates the work. Um, but this is not true of most Impressionist artists. Also, what we're going to see is the use of many bright colors. We'll see short, choppy brush strokes, and the composition is usually very casual and natural and open. And again, this idea is that they were trying to capture this fleeting moment, an impression both visually and personally. So the Impressionists were neither purely objective descriptions of the exterior world, nor solely subjective responses, but they were actually an interaction between the two. Now the Impressionists were very interested on the effect of natural light and atmosphere. And so what we're going to see in some of the works is that the artist would paint the same subject over and over again, but it would be at different times of day and at different times of the year to again show how this natural light and atmosphere can radically change the work. Um, the artists often used these newly developed pigments that were sold in portable tubes, so they didn't have to worry as much about blending um, pigments on canvas. They already had them available for them. And what they would seek to do is also they were very interested in color, and they wanted to see an object's local color in white light. And local color is what we, can sit, what we know an object's color to be. So think of a banana probably thinking of a yellow banana. Yellow is the local color. And what they realize is that this local color becomes modified by the quality of the light shining on it and by the reflections of other objects. And they were also interested in the effects that just opposed colors produce. And then they also saw that shadows do not appear to be just gray or black, but are also composed of many different colors. And they also challenged the established Academy of Art from the salons. Often their works were rejected by the salon because they did not adhere to their strict academic standards. In fact, one critic of the Academy said, um, of the Academy said, the Academy is harmful, all-consuming institution, incapable of fulfilling the goal of its so-called mission. And so what we're beginning to see is not just the artists, but the public becoming um, disillusioned and dissatisfied with what the Academy was deeming as art. And because of this, we are going to see artists such as the Impressionists who actually go outside of the Academy and the salons and set up their own art shows. And because of this, we're going to see more um, galleries develop. And this idea of not necessarily having to go through the Academy helps to expand the art market. What's very interesting about Impressionistic art also is it's often very popular and well-known, but it was a very short movement. It really only lasted about 15 years. And interestingly enough, the term Impressionist was actually first a, um, a, a negative. An art critic was looking at this piece, which is Monet's Impression Sunrise of 1872, and basically said, that's not a sunrise, it's just the impression of one. And basically the Impressionists were like, yes, that's exactly what it is. And so again, here, this is Claude Monet, who was considered the founder of French Impressionism. He was fascinated with the natural effects of light. And again, he would make um, the different colors that the natural light created at different times of day. A student of Monet's stated, quote, I remember his once saying to me, when you go out to paint, try to forget what objects you have before you a tree, a house, a field, or whatever. Merely think, here is a little square of blue, here an oblong of pink, here a streak of yellow, and paint it just as it looks to you. 
the exact color and shape until it gives you your own naive impression of the scene before you. And again, what we see here is with the Impressionist work, we can see here the very quick brush strokes, the clear brush strokes in this. We can tell there's a couple boats on the water and this is sunrise and the sun, but it's definitely a sharp break from the realists that came before this. This is also a sharp break with traditional landscape painting. And this, again, it wasn't, you know, Monet trying to capture the moment as it actually looked, but his own personal impression of it mixed together. Next, this is also by Monet. This is Rouen Cathedral, The Portal in the Sun, 1980, sorry, 1894, Oil on Canvas. And here, this is another example of the same subject matter that he would paint in different times of the day in different weather. In fact, he painted more than 30 views of the cathedral. Um, this cathedral was very well known. This was actually the place where Joan of Arc was executed in 1431. In here, when we look at this, right, this is a painting of the cathedral, but the cathedral itself almost is not what's important. What's important is that play of light. And you can look at this. This is probably midday, very bright sun. And so that play of light on the building becomes the focal point of it especially with the central portal of it. And so that's what the Impressionists were doing, is they were playing with this idea. And also a lot of Impressionistic artworks, when you get a chance to see them, when you're up close to them, it's almost hard to tell what they are because you just see all these small, quick, individual brush strokes. You almost have to move further away to fully understand the image. All right, this work, a little different than those of Monet. This is Gustav Calabante, 1849 to 1893. He is also considered an Impressionistic artist, but we see in his work a little more control than we see in a lot of the other artists. However, he also drew his subjects from the contemporary city life. And in this painting, this is Paris, a rainy day from 1877. Here we're seeing the newly designed and constructed boulevards of Paris. Um, Napoleon III actually ordered Paris. It was still a medieval city. He uh, ordered it to be modified and basically it was rebuilt. And then this laid the groundwork for the city we see today. Again, this is considered an impressionist work because it's his impression of this rainy day. In these newer areas, of course, only the um, upper classes, those with money, could afford to live there. Here we see the brush strokes are clearer, but this strong asymmetric de asymmetrical design is in violation of academic norms. If you look at it, most of the weight of the painting is on the right-hand side. And because of this, it's also his own impression of modern-day city life. It seems very impersonal and very anonymous. It's the dreary, rainy day, and if you look at the individuals, they're almost all dressed the same, and they all have the exact same umbrella. Next is Camille Pissarro, 1830 to 1903. He was born in the Danish West Indies, and interestingly enough, he was the only Jewish member of the Impressionistic movement, and he was largely self-taught. Now this is this painting is from 1898. It's an oil on canvas, and it's showing a busy street on um, in Paris. Here again focuses on that busy Paris street. You get this sense of movement, this sense of frenetic activity. It's almost like we've hit pause, and if we hit play again, everybody's going to start rushing around. Again, we see large, rough brush strokes. And what's very interesting is the street is actually viewed from above, unlike the previous work where it seems he's standing on the street. Here we know Pissarro is actually standing up above, maybe perhaps on a rooftop. And also what we're going to see, because of this angle, we see the canvas become <coughs> excuse me, much flatter. Um, but what we'll see later in post-Impressionism, we are going to see this continued flattening of the canvas. All right, next, this is Pierre-Auguste Renoir, 1841 to 1919. And again, he is looking at ordinary life, but he's not trying to depict it like they were in realism. Here he's showing that good life of the middle class. And this is Dance at Le Monde de Legat, um, 1876, oil on canvas. 
And what we're going to see here is Renoir specialized in portraying the human form and showing what was beautiful in the body. And he did this both in painting and sculpture. This work has a casualness to it because what we're looking at is just these open air cafes, dance clubs. So these are just people um, out probably on a Sunday, that's the day they didn't have to work, and out enjoying this beautiful sunny day. The open composition invites the viewer in. And look at this interesting play of light. We can tell it's a bright sunny day, yet the people in our foreground are sitting under a tree. And so you can see the different effects of light as it shines through the leaves of the tree. And then also look at his use of color. What appears to be blacks are not blacks, but it's this mixture of blues and browns. And he does this in the light and the shadow to help create that sense of depth. Now here we see works almost in between uh, Calabante and Monet's. We do see a lot of the loose brush strokes, but it has more form than Monet does. Interesting enough, part of this does seem a little bit staged. If you look on the right, there is a couple dancing, but they are gazing directly at the viewer, letting us know they are aware that they are being painted. And in fact, these were two friends of Renoir. The woman is Margot, who was a model he often used. And then the male was uh, Solaris, who was a well-known Cuban painter. All right, moving on, this is Edgar Degas, 1834 to 1917. And interesting about Degas, this one we're here, this is the dancing class. This one's actually not in your textbook. Um, but Degas was independently wealthy, and basically he could paint whatever and however he wanted. Interestingly enough, he was not well liked by the other painters. They considered him snobbish and unfriendly. And Degas himself did not believe that art should be available to the lower classes. Basically because they were uneducated, the art he believed was wasted on them. And he is what we call a linear impressionist. And this is where his works are the subject matter of the impressionist, more of the everyday, even though he really liked to focus on the dancers. But his works were much more practice and calculated. He would think them out, and he would often do many, many sketches before he did the work. And he hated the word impressionism. He did not want to be seen as an impressionist because the impressionists had this reputation that their paintings were almost like sketches, that they hadn't been prepared beforehand, and he spent a lot of time preparing his works. However, he does get considered as an impressionist because he does have some sense of that spontaneity seen in his work, and in works such as this one, the rehearsal, you can see that loose brush strokes and the choice and treatment of the subject matter. All right. Next, this is James Abbott McNeil Whistler, 1834 to 1903, and he was an American expatriate, which means he left the United States to live in Europe. And he is a follower of aestheticism, which is the belief that art, it's considered art for art's sake, that art has no other role than to be aesthetically pleasing. Um, he did visit Paris, and this is where he learned about Impressionism, but he lived most of his life in London. Now, this work, again, is one that's not in your text, but I included it because it's probably his most famous work. This one is titled Arrangement in Black and Gray, The Artist's Mother, and it's often known as Whistler's Mother, 1871, also in oil on canvas. And here we see some of the characteristics of the Impressionists, especially in the curtain to the left, but we're going to see here more that's almost going to lead into the post-impressionism, where we're going to see this flattening canvas and little depth within the work. All right, next, um, the impressionists were the small group of artists. They were very inclusive, including they were also open to women. Here we see Marie Cassat. 1844 to 1925, and she was an American. She was from Pittsburgh, but that she did move to Europe. And what you see here in her work is we see this is Casas the Child's Bath, 1893, oil on canvas. And so here again, we're seeing that loose brush stroke, and we're also seeing this kind of very intimate moment between a mother and a child. And in fact, they're both looking at their own reflection within the work. I'm sorry, within the water. 
Next, this is uh, Berta Morizaw, 1841 to 1895, also another female artist. Uh, she was actually married to Manet's younger brother. And in her work, we often see this introspective, and often her work focuses mainly on women and children. Here you can see these very loose brush strokes, and you can tell the short, rapid movement of um, how she was painting. And the figures themselves become so loose they almost tend to lose their forms. And this is Summer Day from 1879, Oil on Canvas. And what's very interesting, in fact, I believe we talked about this in class, if you look to the right, there's actually different ducks or swans within the water. And if you're up close, you really can't tell what they are because of the brush strokes, but when you step back, you see it much clearer. And you can also see this very hurried movement when you look in the larger areas of the women's dresses. It almost looks like scribbling on the canvas. All right. Well, we're going to move from Impressionism into Post-Impressionism. Post-Impressionism, again, we're going to focus mainly on painting. Post-Impressionism evolved from Impressionism. It's not a reaction to, but it evolves from it. And Post-Impressionism is about the 1880s to the 1890s. Usually, Post-Impressionist artists use the same subject matter as the Impressionists, but what Post-Impressionist artists were trying to do is they were more concerned about the formal language of art and what they wanted to do was to give more control to the works of the Impressionists. And what you're going to see is they all kind of do this in different ways. So we have some key characteristics that many of the works share, but we're not going to see the unity of the artistic style like we did in Impressionism. But remember, most post-Impressionists wanted to give more control to Impressionism. All right, um, they were ma maintained the idea of art for art's sake. However, they wanted to move beyond the romantic and the Impressionist view of the world of pure sensation. Again, they wanted more control and greater emphasis on composition and forms. So in many works, we will see paintings become almost a flat surface that are carefully composed of shapes, lines, and colors. In Impressionism, we would see no outlines, but if you look at the work here, this is by Vincent van Gogh, it's Landscape with Wheat Sheaves and Rising Moon, early June 1889, it's an oil on canvas. Here we can see the clearly he has outlined his forms. We see also this quick brush strokes that reminds us of Impressionism, but they are literally contained within the outlines. And that's what we'll see in many of the post-Impressionistic works. Um, often we'll see clean color areas, carefully applied color, and we're going to see some that do this in almost a scientific manner. Okay, this is Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec, 1864 to 1901, and he also was very interested in the Parisian nightlife, but he added a satirical edge, and often his works border on caricature. Um, interesting enough himself, he came from a very well aristocratic family, but he suffered from genetic defects that stunted his growth and left him crippled. And because of this, he actually self-imposed except or self-exiled um, from high society. He didn't see that he would fit, fit in. So he tended to lead more of a bohemian lifestyle, and often he would frequent cafes, dance halls, theaters, and brothels. And these social outcasts became his friends and whom he often depicted in his works. Sadly, he died young. He died at the age of 37 of alcoholism. And here the work we are looking at, this is at the Moulin Rouge, 1892 to 1895. It's an oil on canvas. And here we are seeing the Moulin Rouge, which is a well-known social, um, um, social atmosphere. And this work is based on his own firsthand observations. We see the asymmetrical composition, strong line patterns, and then the dissonant colors. And in fact, the woman close to us on the right in the foreground, the light is hitting her face in such a way that it becomes this blue-like color, almost looks alien-like. We're going to see within the works, he emphasizes or exaggerates many of the elements. And what he's trying to show is he's showing this decadent nightlife that he considered corrupt and cruel. And we see that many of the figures, their faces almost become mask-like. 
Interesting also, he is actually depicted in the work. If you look in the center background, he is actually the short man um, walking with the very tall gentleman. The tall gentleman was his cousin. And so this is almost a way to kind of legitimize that he was actually there and he's painting experiences he would have had. Also, he would experiment with other medias, including poster art. Poster art, these were created through the printing process using multicolored lithographs. And in the late 1870s, what was developed was a printing press that was capable of handling extra large sheets of paper. And because of this, we're going to see advertisers using these posters to promote special events, such as this one. This is Jane Avril, 1893, and it is a color lithograph. Give an example of the size. This is four feet, two and a half inches by three feet, one inch. In here, it's advertising a celebrated dancer who was performing at the Garden of Paris, which was a well-known cabaret. Here, we're seeing these flat colors with very prominent outline. And we see, if we look at her leg, this very exaggerated foreshortening. And then the other figure in this, if you look in the right foreground, it's a bass viola player and he is reduced to just the forearm, his head, and to the top part of his instrument. And what's interesting is that top part of the instrument that we see, it actually goes and then creates the frame of the form, um, sending our eye through the canvas and then back down to her leg, which points us back to him. All right, next we're going to move on to probably the post-impressionist artist who was the most scientific in his trying to gain control of Impressionism. This is Georges Seurat, 1859 to 1891, and he was a French artist. And again, his works are almost scientific, and he developed a method which is called pointillism. And what he does, this is slowly applying the paint one dot at a time with the point of the brush. Here what he saw is that this gave him um, an accurate depiction of light and color. And he does show attention to perspective, meaning we can see atmospheric perspective here. This is a Sunday afternoon on the island of La Grande Jatte, 1884 to 1886. It's an oil on canvas, and it is a very large piece. It's 6 feet 9 and 3 fourths inches by 10 feet 1 and a quarter inches. Again, the subject matter, this is people enjoying a sunny, sunny Sunday afternoon, and it shows this cross-section of Parisian, Parisian society. We see the working man on the left next to a couple. We see probably a, na um, a nanny with her child um, care, child ward, I guess, in the center. And then on the right, we see this couple, and your textbook alludes that the woman is actually probably a prostitute. But here we see with this painstaking application of, of the pointillism, that's this very scientific and very technical in the work. And here again, the clip, this film was featured in the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And I provide the clip here because what's interesting is that they kind of zoom in on it. And so you can see how detailed and how deep this application of colored dots is. All right, next we're going to move on to Vincent van Gogh, 1853 to 1890, and he was a Dutch artist. Usually in his painting, he would paint very quickly, and usually we're going to see a thicker application of paint. And his works have been what's called emotionalism, and we're going to see they're going to be, sometimes they're also considered expressionistic artworks. What we see in expressionistic artworks is this is where the artist want the viewer to be able to feel the same emotion the artist was um, feeling when they created the work. And Van Gogh is honestly more of a transitional artist from post-impressionism into expressionism. Here, though, um, his works often reflect his own personal struggles, including his struggles with mental illness. He was very interested in colors and in complementary bright colors, and he believed colors could express both the quiet and the harmonious rural life, but they could also express uh, the turmoil. He said, I use color more arbitrarily so as to express myself forcibly. I don't care so much whether my color is exactly the same as long as it looks beautiful on my canvas. 
And again, we see these clear brush strokes, but we see a much heavier use than we did in pointillism. Many of his works, we're also going to see this harsh outline, which we would not have seen in Impressionistic works. Now, this is Night Cafe from 1888. It is also an oil on canvas. In here, what he wanted to show was this was actually a cafe he would go to, and he wanted to show this oppressive atmosphere. He said this was a place one can go to ruin oneself, go mad, or commit a crime. I want to express the power of darkness in a low drinking spot, in an atmosphere like a devil's furnace. And he said here it shows the terrible passions of humanity, the figures of little sleeping hooligans. And again, I already said he was a transition into Expressionism, and we can see that in probably one of his most famous works of Starry Night, 1889, also in oil on canvas. And here, um, this is, many believe this painting is based on when he had put himself into a mental institution, and this was actually the view from his room. Now, he did not paint it there, um, but it would have been the view he saw, and it's expressing and communicating his feelings about the electrifying vastness of the universe and even his own turmoil within um, his own personal life. All right, moving on, we have Paul Gauguin, 1848 to 1903, also a French artist. Interesting enough, he was originally a banker and a stockbroker in Paris, but he suffered a personal crisis at 35. He left his wife and five children and became an artist. Eventually, he has this desire to escape the everyday world, and he sails to Tahiti in 1891, where he lived in a wooden hut, painted all day naked, and called himself Monsieur Savage. Um, there, he married a Tahitian woman and had a son. But this work is more um, one of his earlier works, and here this is an example of the symbolist, where he uses symbols to represent ideas or religious ideas in his works. And this is Vision After the Sermon, or also known as Jacob Wrestling with the Angel, 1888. It's an oil on canvas. Here again, we see these heavy outlines and these very flattened forms, and he was more concerned about the symbolic meaning than trying to show realism within the work. He twisted the perspective and allowed in most of the space to emphasize the innocent faith of the unquestioning women who are praying in the front and along the left, rather than Jacob, the figure of the biblical story, are, are wrestling with the angel. And for Gauguin, he rejected objective representation in favor of subjective expression. And for him, he believed the artist's power was being able to determine the colors in a painting and that this was actually a central element of creativity. The second work here by Gauguin, this is called The Day of the Gods from 1894. It's an oil on canvas, and this shows uh, one of the works from his time in Tahiti. Again, you can still see, you know, he uses the flat figures, the bold colors um, of the previous works. All right, next we're moving to Paul Cezanne, 1839 to 1906, also a French artist. And Cezanne is very important because he's considered the father of modern art. And what he wanted to show in his works is he wanted to show order, stability, and permanence. And he carefully constructed each piece. And you're going to see in his works the strong use of geometric shapes and outlining. And what he believed was the shapes show that underlying forms found in nature. And he often took liberties with color. He was recording the color, color patterns that he deduced from an optical analysis of nature, not necessarily what was actually there. Also, he distorts and combines space. And we see within the work, there's both shifting and receding perspective. And here is Mont Saint Victory from the Large Pine Tree, 1887, oil on canvas. And you can see that shifting of perspective. We see the tree here, and at part it seems to be in the foreground, yet when you look, the branches almost seem to combine with the hillside itself. Um, he would say um, this distorted space and this 
focus on the geometric forms. In fact, he said, treat nature by the cylinder, the sphere, the cone, everything in proper perspective so that each side of an object or a plane is directed towards a central point. And here what we can see, if you look into the landscape, he's broken the plane down into these little boxes. And again, he linked the foreground and the background with the trees. And what we're going to see, this is breaking things down into these little squares, is going to be very, very influential to modern artists, especially the cubists. All right, again, we can see this flattening of the canvas in this work. This, again, is by Cezanne. This is Basket of Apples, circa 1895, and it's an oil on canvas. Here, it's a still life, but he's not trying to be photographic in the manner. Again, we see that flattening of the subject matter. It almost becomes two-dimensional instead of trying to appear three-dimensional, and the objects themselves become more just shapes. They become the cylinders and the spheres, and... If you pay attention, you can actually see some of the objects are actually depicted from different vantage points, meaning where the, where the viewer is standing. All right, well, moving from post-impressionism, we're going to look at symbolism. Symbolism developed near the end of the 19th century, and this is where we have artists that were turning away from the real and instead focusing on the imaginary. And what they would often do is depict a fantasy world of forms they conjured in their own minds and with their own free imagination. The symbolists would speak in symbols and signs, hence where the style got its name. Their task, they believed, was not to see things, but to see through them to a significance and reality far deeper than what superficial appearance revealed. And they believe the artist must become deranged. In fact, a quote is, quote, they must systematically unhinge and confuse the everyday faculties of sense and reason, which serve only to blur artistic vision. The artist's mystical vision must convert the objects from the common sense world into symbols of a reality beyond that world, and ultimately a reality from within the individual, unquote. And so the artists were um, trying to stand against what they considered the vulgar, vulgar materialism and conventional values of the industrial and the middle class society. They wished to purge art and literature of anything utilitarian, using anything useful. And they were strongly influenced by Sigmund Freud's theories of the unconscious. And many of these works are actually going to foreshadow the surrealists that we'll see in the next chapter. Here you're looking at Gustave Moreau, 1826 to 1898, and this is the apparition, 1874 to 76, and this is actually a watercolor on paper. Moreau would often draw his subjects from both classical mythology and the Bible. And here what we're seeing, it's based on a biblical tale, but it also has that idea of the femme fatale, meaning the fatal woman. And here we see Salome, who is erotically dancing for King Herod, who was her stepfather. And the biblical story is she is the one who asks for the head of John the Baptist, which you can see has appeared, this apparition just floating in the sky, is John the Baptist. And so what we see here, it's a combination of hallucinatory imagery, eroticism, precise drawing, rich color, and opulent setting that all became the hallmark of his style. Another symbolist artist, this is Henri Rousseau, 1844 to 1910, and he would focus on this world of personal fantasy. He was largely self-taught in his works, and his works honestly usually received universally uh, unfavorable reviews because his works were seen to lack reflection of his, um, reflection of his lack of formal training. We have the use of imperfect perspective, and these flat, almost doll-like figures, and many of the critics claim that his settings actually look like theatrical sets, that there was nothing realistic about it. Here we see Sleeping Gypsy, 1897. This also is an oil on canvas, and it's exactly what it says. We see a gypsy lying there asleep, and a lion is coming up and investigating them. And the idea behind this is that it's supposed to show the uneasiness of a personal's vulnerable subconscious self during sleep. 
Because the idea with Freud was that this is when our subconscious tends to manifest itself when we are sleeping. All right, next we're going to look at the fin de soleil, which tra uh, translates into the end of the century. This was another um, cultural shift in art. This is uh, Europe culture of the late 18, 1800s. And near the end of the century, we're going to see this idea that the masses, that many people embraced a culture of decadence and indulgence. And you see that in work such as this. This is Gustav Klimp, 1863 to 1918. This is his work, The Kiss, from 1903 to 19, I'm sorry, 1907 to 1908, and it's an oil on canvas. And again, this reflects the culture of the time. And what we see here is we see an erotic scene between an embracing uh, couple who are both on their knees. Yet the figures themselves dissolve into the shimmering, extravagant, flat patterning. This shows clear ties to Art Nouveau and the arts and craft movement that we'll talk about in just a few moments. What's also interesting here is this pattern actually shows gender constraints. We can see the male form is made of the rectangles and the female form is made of the softer circles. All right, well, switching to sculpture, probably the most famous sculptor of the time was Auguste Rodin, 1840 to 1917, and he was a French artist. This is one of his works called The Kiss, and what happens is he would often use models, but he liked to walk around them so he could see the form itself in motion. And because of this, we see this sense of movement or impressionism in the works itself. And he is usually considered more of an impressionist artist because he was very interested in the effect of light on sculpted surfaces. In fact, he said, the sculptor must learn to reproduce the surface, which means all that vibrates on the surface, soil, love, passion, life. Sculpture is thus the art of hollows and mounds, not of smoothness or even polished planes. And then this work, this one is in your textbook, this is The Gates of Hell from 1880 to 1900. He worked on this for 20 years. But in fact, it actually wasn't even cast, means made into the bronze you see here, until 1917 after his own death. And this is a massive work. It is 20 feet 10 inches by 13 feet 1 inch. And again, he worked on this for over two decades. And he was commissioned, these are actual doors, and these doors were the doors that were planned for the Museum of Decorative Arts in Paris. However, it never actually opened. And what you see on the doors, it's actually different scenes from Dante's The Inferno, which is part of the Divine Comedy. Here you see there are almost nearly 200 figures in the work, and they're all in flux. They're shifting, they're moving, and it's showing them suffering in hell. And then what he did, though, is he actually did take some of these figures from the work and he made them into larger individual works, such as when you see here right above the doors in the center, you see Dante himself sitting there pondering, right? And this is actually The Thinker, probably his most well-known work. And The Thinker, um, 1879 to 1898, it is a bronze, but what happens with this is how these are used, it's a form called substitution. So one form is substituted for another, one medium. In these with bronze, this always requires the use of a mold. And so the original was made, but then about 20 different castings were done of this. In fact, there was one that sits in front of Grahmeyer Hall in, at the University of Louisville. But here again, you can see the form. The sculpture itself has to have form to it, otherwise it'd just be a lump. But you can see like almost like the Impressionist rough brush strokes, especially if you look at the thinker's head and along his back, you can see almost the brush strokes, if you will, of the sculpture itself. All right, and then next, this is Camille, Camille um, Claudel, 1864 to 1943, also a French artist. She was a student, model, and then eventual lover of Rodin, uh, Rodin, and we can see his influence in her works. Often in her works, she would focus on the human form, and she did make some larger works, but she largely specialized in small-scale bronzes, such as the one we see here. This is the Waltz 1892, 
it's a bronze and it's only nine and seven eight inches tall originally this was just a nude couple dancing but the public was too shocked so she added costumes to this version of the work and again we see that kind of decadence to it that movement and especially in the bottom part of it where we see again this hollows and roughness more associated with impressionistic works all right, quickly we're going to talk about a couple different artistic styles at the time. Here we're looking at what's called the arts and craft movement. This again was in the 19th century in England, and it was pioneered by John Rushkin, who was an art critic, and William Morris, who was an artist. Here we're looking at Morris's work, which is the Green Dining Room from South Kensington Museum, located in London, England, and this room was done in 1867. And what we're going to see with the arts and craft movement is members of this movement had a distrust of machines and industrial capitalism. They advocated for an art made by people for the people as a joy for the maker and both the user. And they dedicated themselves to making functional objects with highly aesthetic value for a wide public. And so um, part of the things they would do would be wallpaper, things that were not mass produced by a machine. And they, the style itself was often based on natural rather than artificial forms, which they often, um, these works often consisted of repeated design of floral or geometric patterns. And you can see that in the wallpaper here. If you look at it, it's a floral design, but it's square in itself and it's almost repeated over and over. Um, their works had a high quality of artis artisanship, and they believed that this, along with honest labor, were crucial ingredients of superior works of decorative arts. Also at this time, we have Art Nouveau, meaning new art, and this was about the 1890s to the early 1900s. It was launched by Victor Horada, 1867 to 1947, a Belgium artist. Now this did grow out of the English arts and craft movement, and it was in more of a response to the Eiffel Tower. And what happens here is the Art Nouveau strove to reflect modernism, but it also wanted to keep this sense of a pre-industrial sense of beauty. Here we're going to see a fascination with plant and animal life and organic growth, and this use of organic forms and traditional materials of wood and stone. You're going to see a strong Japanese influence in the works, especially the curving lines. And this, um, this Art Nouveau spread throughout Europe, again, as a reaction to industrialization. The work you see here, this is the same building that's in your textbook, just from a different angle. This is Antoni Guada, Casa uh, Batalo, 1905-07, in Barcelona, Spain. And here what he's doing is there's very few, if you look at it, it's an apartment building, but there's very few flat areas or straight lines. And the work itself almost seems as if it was cut from stone but molded from clay. And in what Godi would do is he would actually conceive of the building as a whole. And then often he would mold it almost as a sculptor might shape a figure from clay. All right, next ending with some more architecture, we have the Eiffel Tower. This was by Gustav, Gustav Eiffel, 1832 to 1923. And this was first created for an exhibition in Paris in 1889. At 984 feet, it was the world's tallest structure at the time and remained so until the Empire State Building was constructed. Here again, we see the steel frame work that we've seen in bridges such as that. And the idea with this is that this transparency, right, this openness, we can see through it, it actually tends to blur the distinction between the interior and the exterior to an extent that we've never seen before or achieved or even attempted. All right, and then the United States, um, we're going to see the rise of the American skyscrapers. And what we'd seen is a lot of the works had been constructed with steel. However, there were problems. The idea was that steel was um, resistant to fire, but that was not the case. And so what happens is it developed the idea of encasing the metal in masonry, meaning in some sort of brick. And it combines the steel strength and then the masonry's fire resistance. 
probably the most well-known American architect at the time was Louis Sullivan, 1856 to 1924. And he is often considered the first truly modern architect. And what he does is in his works, he would use the latest technology to create these skyscrapers that were light-filled, well-ventilated office buildings. And he would then adorn both the exteriors and interiors with ornate establishments. So he's connecting both commerce and culture. These aren't just impersonal buildings, but we're going to see this decoration to them. And here, this is the Guarantee, or now known as the Prudential Building, 1894 to 1896, and it's located within Buffalo, New York. And what we hear, we, it has a steel frame, but the steel frame is then sheathed in terracotta. It's very large and refined. The evenly spacing of the windows gives the office building an orderly fashion, which is perfect for the office building. Yet, you still see this lively ornamentation on both the piers and the cornice of the building itself. And Sullivan was very well known for this idea of what he calls form follows function, meaning that in architecture, the architect must first look at the function of the building, what it is going to be designed, what it's going to do, what is the function of it. So here an office building, a museum is to show art, um, a football stadium, right? It's there to hold a football game. And what this idea of form follows function is, is that the form of the building must follow the intended function of it then you can worry about um, the aesthetics of it. So, for example, you couldn't have, you know, a football stadium that only has a 50-yard field. The function of that stadium is to hold football games. Well, you can't adequately hold a football game on a 50-yard field. So this does not mean that buildings can't be beautiful, but that the architect must first think of the function and then focus on the aesthetics. All right, that concludes Chapter 28. Um, and next week we will be moving on to modernism.